Okay guys, we are set to go into the end of section one, beginning of section two today. Couple of reminders as we're in unit five, your assignments are due on Tuesday. That is the last day before break at 11.59 instead of this Friday. Remember that we have quite a few readings that we're doing all of the reflections for. I think there's 13 of them. And then you have your unit five documents. There's about 10 documents there. We're responding in complete sentences. Your short paper for this unit is also posted. The tentative date uh, for your test is the same as your short paper. That would be December 8th. I wanted to do a quick review of federalism before we get into section two. So if we remember the term sectionalism is the division of power between the state and the federal government. Who has what rights? Now as we expand the country, the nation, the North and the South are going to have very different ideas on which side they support when it comes to federalism. States' rights is very much going to be a Southern idea, especially on the key issue of the regulation of slavery. And the North is going to be of the mind that the federal government has that power. So more of a federal uh, expansion of powers, including the regulation of slavery. Now, the political parties that we have moving into the Civil War, get as we get closer, we had the Whig Party that formed in opposition of Andrew Jackson. We have the Democratic Party that is Jackson's party that he leaves behind. And what we're going to see start to form is the Republican Party. Now, these Democratic and Republican uh, parties that you see here are very different than the Democratic and Republican parties that we know today. The Democrats during this time are going to support states' rights. The Republicans during this time are going to support the federal rights. We also have some pre, uh, pretty clear economic differences between these political parties. Uh, the Democrats are going to support more of an agriculture-based economy. The Republicans are going to support more of that merchant, industrial-based economy. And when it comes to the federal influence on that, uh, it, it really depends on what political party you're in and what issue you are asking for. Um, both are really going to be of the mind that the government shouldn't regulate too much because then it's difficult for business to flourish, to do well, um, but that there should be some government support to ensure that business is doing well. So it's kind of a double-edged sword if you're the government in that realm. All right, let's look at the beginnings of this war. We need to kind of get up to speed on our westward expansion here. How did we go from the 13 colonies uh, out to uh, the west? What have we purchased? What did we do with it? Well, the beginnings of our expansion were that Louisiana Purchase. If you get past the War of 1812 and the land that we got all the way to the Mississippi River, going beyond the Mississippi River is that Louisiana Purchase as made by Thomas Jefferson. In order to figure out what to do, with the land that we obtained, we follow the Northwest Ordinance. And in the Northwest Ordinance, it states that there would not be slavery in any new territories because that would upset the very delicate balance that we had in Congress. When we talk about the balance in Congress, it's very important that we note that there was an equal number of slaveholding states and non-slaveholding states, or just equal number of states and representatives that were on either side of the issue. Should the federal government pass a law regarding slavery or not, whether that's keeping it, whether that's getting rid of it, we needed to make sure that that balance was kept because if that balance was upset, then we would have an all-out war. Manifest destiny is a term that explains that idea that it was our destiny, it was our fate, it was our duty to expand from sea to shining sea. That manifest destiny is going to encourage us to continue to go out west and really organize that territory of the Louisiana Purchase. 
So we run into this issue that we can't just use the Northwest Ordinance. It's unfair. If we just say that slavery can't exist in all of these new territories, then that will upset the balance. So what we come up with instead is going to be the Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise is going to draw a line that divides the United States, what they said was in half, now we can see by the map that that's not very clear because the red line there is the 3630 line. Above the line, all the states would be free with the exception of Missouri. You can see that blue state there. That's the only state that came in during the Missouri Compromise that would be a slaveholding state. Now, because this is a compromise, if Missouri is going to come in as a slaveholding state, then we need a free state to come in as well, and that would be the state of Maine. So the Missouri Compromise draws the 3630 line to prevent any further issues. We add two states, one to go to each side, and the idea was that this compromise being passed in 1820 would solve all the problems forever. The biggest problem, and I hope that you can see this on that map, if you extended the 3630 line, there is a considerable amount of land, more amount of land in the north than there is in the south, meaning that that balance would immediately be upset. And we know that we are going to expand out further because the Mexican-American War is going to happen. We are going to gain that territory. We get the Oregon Territory up there as well. We're going to have the Texas annexation. So we are going to become the whole coastal United States all the way out to the Pacific Coast. But we're eventually going to have to come back to this issue. It is not uh, a fix here. Now, we previously talked about the tariff of abominations, but I want to bring it back because it's going to be one of these sectional issues that causes problems leading into the, the Civil War. So this tariff of abominations was first passed in 1828 by John Quincy Adams. This, remember, is the first time that the South really reacts in a way that they question, can we leave the Union? because the southern states are going to claim that that tariff was harmful to their economy and only protected the northern manufacturing, which they're not really wrong. South Carolina is going to react with what was called the doctrine of nullification. If we remember, to nullify means to get rid of. In this doctrine of nullification, the states, specifically South Carolina, are claiming the power to reject a federal law saying that it is unconstitutional, these taxes, and we are just not going to pay them. The South also proposed this idea of we'll just leave. We don't have to follow the idea of the federal government. That's not really how it works. Uh, so the Compromise Tariff of 1833 is going to be passed in order to keep the South happy. So the goal here between Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun was to pass something that would reduce the tariff over time in order to keep the South happy, prevent further conflict, prevent the South Carolina from invoking this uh, doctrine of nullification. And the compromise tariff does work, but it starts to bring out this question of, can we question the Constitution? Is there a power in there that says the states can just nullify a federal law? We don't know. But this event here brings up the idea that the states can turn their back on the federal government if they so choose. Without the Compromise Tariff of 1833, South Carolina would have just refused to pay the tax. And that's not really how we thought the Constitution worked. But in this situation, that question comes up of, can we just ignore it if we don't like it? We need to talk a little bit about the elephant in the room here. Uh, slavery within the territories. Between the time uh, of, of Andrew Jackson leading up to the Civil War, we're going to have uh, some questions to if slavery should continue to exist or not. One of the very 
beginning uh, questions that we have here is the Wilmot Proviso. This was a piece of legislation that in the House of Representatives had declared neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall ever exist in the lands won in the Mexican-American War. Now we know that if a law gets proposed in the House of Representatives, it has to go to the Senate, then it has to go to the President. The Wilmot Proviso is going to make it through the House, but it never becomes a law because it could not pass the very evenly divided Senate. This would have really caused some issues if it had passed in the Senate. What it was, though, is it was created in reaction to the land that we gained in the Mexican-American War. The North really saw this opportunity to prevent the expansion of the life of the South, to prevent the expansion of slavery. So it's passed in retaliation also to President Polk, who had supported the South and lowering the tariff and denying funds for those internal improvements that the North really relied on for their trade. The North was kind of shouting at the rooftops here that they're not going to be ignored. Their ideas are not going to be ignored. They're going to come for slavery when given the opportunity. Now, the real uh, little kick in the teeth here for the South is they named it the Wilmot Proviso for David Wilmot of Pennsylvania. He was a representative who was a known racist. So they kind of uh, poke fun at this, this man in making a stop all use of slavery uh, piece of legislation and name it after him. Now, in the election of 1848, President Polk had died uh, four months after leaving office, so he's not going to seek re-election. Uh, we have a couple of candidates here. One, we have Zachary Taylor, who is of the Whig Party, uh, and he wanted to be elected before the political party dies. Uh, we ha He is an old war hero. He is known as old rough and ready. He owned slaves. He appealed to the Southerners. He didn't really commit to either side of the issue. Uh, uh, he is going to win the election here. But he's going to die in 1850, leaving Millard Fillmore to take over the presidency. Notice that we have a third political party there. It's not just the Whigs versus the Democrats. We have Martin Van Buren, who's really trying to stick in there in politics, uh, coming out with the Free Soil Party. Now, the Free Soil Party is interesting because it's the first political party that runs on this idea of no extension of slavery. Uh, Van Buren was also running on a very moderate tariff. He would support the internal improvements, uh, and he also wanted to pass a homestead law. Uh, the homestead law would help encourage people to move out west. Uh, but this party just doesn't draw enough votes away from the Democratic Party to sway the election. Uh, instead, it draws just enough votes away from the two main political parties that it pushes the vote towards Zachary Taylor for the Whig Party. So in the election of 1848, it's important to note that the Free Soil Party runs on this idea of no extension of slavery. It's the first time this ever made it to the national uh, the national stage there. I want to go over one final uh, compromise here that we have to look at. I guess this isn't the final compromise, but the next compromise in our timeline leading into the Civil War. So if you recall, just a few minutes ago, we went through the Compromise of 1850. And the Compromise of 1850 uh, is going to be an addition to the Compromise of 1820, that Missouri Compromise that we just talked about. The Missouri Compromise, if you recall, drew the 3630 line, which you can see on the map here. And we determined when we talked about the Missouri Compromise that it would not last into the future. If we extended that line, it would be incredibly uneven. So we were going to have to start over. So what we see happening in 1850 is the realization of that in the federal government. Also, by 1850, we have gotten the new territory. Right, we you can see there that we have the New Mexico Territory, Utah Territory, we have California, uh, Texas is there, uh, and we have the Oregon Territory. Now that we have all this land, it becomes a serious issue. 
whether slavery is going to extend into these territories or not. So what ends up happening is we come to a compromise. And within this compromise, the North and the South are going to get certain features. In the North, they get the state of California. California comes in as a free state in 1850. That's great. Also, the North gets the ending of the slave trade in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. Another win for the North. The South, however, is going to get uh, this idea of popular sovereignty in both the Utah Territory and the New Mexico Territory, meaning that they, the people there are going to get to decide if they want slavery within their state or not. So this could go towards the North or the South, but the South considers it a win because the people get to vote. The people get to decide. It is up to them. The South is also going to get a win in that slavery can still exist in Washington, D.C., but the slave trade is ended in Washington, D.C., the biggest win for the South when it comes to the Compromise of 1850, and I want you to make sure that you make a note of this, is the Fugitive Slave Laws are passed. The Fugitive Slave Act is going to be a point that many Northerners are very angered by because what this law does is it makes everybody in the United States a slave catcher. Everybody is a slave catcher. Any slave that is found is supposed to be returned to the South. Now, this makes quite a few comments. First, it makes the comment that slaves are property that can be returned to their owner. That's a massive statement. It also makes the statement that we don't know who is a runaway slave and who is not. This law gets very, very blurry, very gray area because there are freed slaves that have been freed by their owners. There are free men and women who are African-American living throughout the country, mainly in the northern states, but that's not going to stop people. They're not going to ask, are you a runaway slave? You must be returned. This law creates a very dangerous, <coughs> a very dangerous situation in that there are going to be people who were not slaves sold back into slavery or returned uh, or pushed into slavery because this fugitive slave law is really going to encourage people to gather anybody that they believed was a slave. And that does not mean that that was the reality. Uh, some will argue that this compromise was even less successful than the Missouri Compromise because of the popular sovereignty, because of the fugitive slave laws, because there really was no ending to slavery. Again, just like the Missouri Compromise, the Compromise of 1850 is going to be a band-aid leading into the Civil War. When we talk about... Uh, this idea of slavery and the two sides of the issue, we have to talk about the uh, abolitionists. Now, the word to abolish means to get rid of. And in a second here, I have posted in Teams an excerpt or a piece from Uncle Tom's Cabin that I want you to take a minute and read over. And there's a couple of questions that I want you to respond to. So I'll wrap this up. Don't worry. Um, but the abolitionist side is going to argue that slavery should be ended and this push towards um, fighting to end slavery with federal legislation. And the way that you do that is by getting the people within the United States rallied around the issue. So some of the most famous abolitionists that you are going to need to recognize are Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, who we will look more at uh, at the beginning of the day tomorrow, and Harriet Tubman. These people are going to push to end slavery in the United States. They are going to be very outspoken about ending slavery in the United States. Now, 
Harriet Beecher Stowe is also considered um, a, a leader in this fight to end slavery. And she is going to write Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, I would put a star next to this in your notes so you also know that this is very important. Uncle Tom's Cabin is going to be a novel written it's meant it's said to be fictional but it is based on very real events um uncle tom's cabin is a description of a slaveholding farm uh and it describes the absolute atrocities of slavery it it describes what day-to-day -day life looks like it describes what uh the farm life is what the work is how these people are treated emphasis on people are treated now, the reason that this, this book is so important is people in the North had no idea how bad slavery was. Uh, they had not traveled to the South to see a plantation. They did not understand what life was like. But reading Uncle Tom's Cabin, seeing those words in black and white, really changes the approach of the people and rallies people around this idea that we have to push to get rid of slavery. So it inspires more abolitionists. Um, famously, and I don't know if I believe it or not, uh, it is supposed to have been that when Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, he said to her, so you're the little woman that started this big war, uh, meaning that her novel was so impactful that it really pushed this conflict to come about. Uh, because the Compromise of 1850 does not really outline what is supposed to happen in the territories where popular sovereignty is used, we are going to have to revisit that issue, and we are revisiting it with the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1954. The Kansas-Nebraska Act is going to come from Stephen Douglas of Illinois, he split the Whig Party where we have the North Whigs uh, and we have the South Whigs. The Northern Whigs are going to recognize themselves as the Republican Party. So we're starting to see the emergence of the Republican Party here. Uh, and they are going to feel that the Compromise of 1820 was being ignored. So they begin to ignore the Fugitive Slave Laws, which only causes more tension. Uh, what it looks like when we look at the state of Nebraska and the state of Kansas as they are about to gain statehood, we know that Nebraska at the time is gonna, going to outlaw slavery. It wasn't really uh, useful to their economy. They can't grow cotton there. So we know that when Nebraska got to use popular sovereignty, that they were going to uh, get rid of slavery. But Kansas is a little different. Uh, it's up for debate. It kind of resembles Missouri, which was a slave state. Uh, in 1854, you are going to see this, something we did not expect, but there are going to be 1,700 men that come from Missouri across the border. So they're coming from Missouri, a slaveholding state, crossing the border. We call these guys border ruffians because they're going to threaten anybody that opposed slavery that was going to vote to keep Kansas a, uh, a, a non-slaveholding state. So these border ruffians come from Missouri and they say to the voters, you better vote to keep slavery in Kansas or else. And they really meant it. Now, this is before the days of voter intimidation laws, and this is before the days where we had private voting, where it was uh, done behind a curtain. No, these people, these border ruffians really swayed the vote in Kansas and pro-slavery is going to win. But the anti-slavery population in Kansas is going to outnumber them in the state. So soon the anti-slavery population is going to want to form their own government. And we have this issue, and we'll get to John Brown at the beginning of the day tomorrow, where you have people within one state that are fighting each other. In the Kansas-Nebraska Act, saying that Kansas and Nebraska get to vote, they get to use popular sovereignty, they get to determine their own fate, was supposed to solve this, but it doesn't. It does the opposite. Instead, it creates this coalition of pro-slavery <coughs> advocate or anti-slavery advocates that are led by John Brown. Now, the problem here 
is that both sides within the state of Kansas, the pro-slavery side, the anti-slavery side led by John Brown, they're both going to have weapons. And at the time, the president is Franklin Pierce. He's going res- to refuse to solve the issue. He says, let them fix it. Kansas is their own state now. They've got their own problem. Let them figure it out. That doesn't work. Ultimately, what happens is we see the Potawatomi Creek Massacre. Potawatomi, if you're trying to spell it, is P-O-T-T-A-W-A-T-O-M-I-E. Potawatomi Creek Massacre. Now, again, we've heard this word massacre in history before, trying to evoke that, (coughs) that idea there. John Brown is going to set out to fight the pro-slavery forces. John Brown is going to lead a midnight attack. And in this midnight attack of his anti-slavery forces, five pro-slavery supporters are going to be killed. And this right here, the Potawatomi Creek Massacre, led by John Brown, a fighter against slavery, is going to elevate the conflict because before this, there had never been any bloodshed, but now there has been. I want to wrap us up today with a little look at the case of Dred Scott versus Sanford, and I want you to put a star next to this in your notes. And I'm going to show you a little video here in just a second. And the two main takeaways of this case we are going to come back to. But I want you looking for what was decided in the case and what effect did this decision have. In the 1850s, the United States was headed for civil war. Tensions were high over the expansion of slavery in the American West. In Kansas, for example... Bloody fighting erupted between northern and southern settlers who fought to establish bleeding Kansas as either a slave state or a free state. In the midst of all this fighting, northern abolitionists were preventing slave catchers from forcing runaway slaves back into slavery. Chief Justice Roger Taney and the court thought they could prevent civil war with the 1857 decision in Dred Scott v. Sanford. Historical context is important in understanding this landmark case. Congress had been trying for decades to resolve the tensions between slave states and free states through carefully crafted compromises. For example, the 1820 Missouri Compromise allowed Maine to enter the Union as a free state and Missouri as a slave state. The Compromise also banned slavery in the Louisiana Territory north of the 3630 parallel, while allowing it in territory south of that line. Dred Scott was a slave who lived in Missouri and eventually moved with his master to the free states of Illinois and Wisconsin. When Dred Scott's master moved back to Missouri, Dred Scott sued for his freedom, claiming that he became free when they moved to the northern free states. The Supreme Court agreed to hear the case, as they hoped it would settle political tensions surrounding slavery. Chief Justice Roger B. Taney, a supporter of the South, wanted a firm united action against northern abolitionist sentiment. So, in ruling on the case, He arrogantly tried to settle the highly charged issue of slavery himself once and for all, rather than see Congress, which had debated the issue carefully for decades, plan out a solution. In a controversial 7-2 decision, the court decided that African Americans were not citizens. Therefore, they did not have the right to sue in court. Writing the decision for the court, Taney incorrectly and stubbornly claimed that the founders believed that African Americans had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. He ruled that Congress did not have the constitutional authority to ban slavery from the states, and therefore, the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. Taney decided this despite Article 4, Section 3 of the Constitution, which reads, Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. Because of the Due Process Clause, Taney wrote, slaveholders could take their property wherever they wanted, and slavery could not be prohibited in any state or territory. One of the dissenters, Justice Benjamin Curtis, correctly asserted that free blacks were citizens with the right to vote in five states at the time of the founding. He wrote, it would be strange if we were to find in the Constitution anything which deprived of their citizenship any part of the people of the United States who were among those by whom it was established. Contrary to Taney's intentions, the Dred Scott decision significantly heightened sectional tensions between North and South and contributed to the coming of the Civil War four years later. The case 
is seen as an infamous travesty of injustice and one of the worst decisions in the history of the Supreme Court. For more information on this and many other important court cases throughout history, be sure to... Okay, so what was decided in the case and what effect did this decision have? I want you to turn and talk to your partner for about 30 seconds here and then we will uh, wrap things up. Okay, the main takeaways of the Dred Scott versus Sanford decision. <coughs> you have Dred Scott who was fighting for his freedom in the courts. And what ultimately the Supreme Court tells him is two things. One, uh, people are, uh, slaves are property, not people. Therefore, Dred Scott had no rights to even exist in the Supreme Court asking for his freedom because he was not a person. He was property. And that is a big turning point here. Calling slaves property instead of people tells them that they have no rights and no one has any uh, obligation to treat them like people. Uh, also, it makes the comment on slavery in the territories. It says that Congress doesn't have the right to regulate slavery in the territory. So essentially, it declares the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional because the Missouri Compromise did just that. It was the federal government saying which territories could have slavery and which ones could not. The Supreme Court here is saying federal government doesn't have the opportunity to do that. People get to decide if they want to have slavery in these territories or not. So while this decision is monumental, it's monumental for all the wrong reasons. It took away what little hope slaves had in pushing for their rights and calling them property, not people. And it declared the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional. Just a couple of reminders here. Make sure that you do the reading of Uncle Tom's Cabin that's in there. There's only one or two questions with it. Just read it, discuss it. You can do the questions together and uh, submit that form. Uh, your assignments are due on Tuesday and we'll be back here tomorrow with another video. Any questions, comments, or concerns, shoot me a message.